I don't know. I was hoping it'd be a quick one, but I guess it's not. Gonna okay. Happen. Looks like uh, everybody's present. Sorry to keep you uh, waiting. Looks like we have a full house, so I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, convened from closed session. There are no uh, closed session uh, items to report. Could we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay. Per board policy 2350, any person may address the board at this time, either on an agenda item or other matters of interest to the public that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker, with a maximum time of 15 minutes per item, unless otherwise extended by the board. Uh, are there any uh, public comments today on items on the agenda? Okay, apparently none. Are there public comments concerning items not on the agenda today? None. All right, that will move us to uh, uh, item uh, six. Uh, we obviously were not going to have a student trustee report as we are in between uh, representatives. Uh, board member reports today. Let's start at the far end, see if anybody has anything today. Things kind of quiet? I'm going to make a quick comment on graduation. I have had um, lots of positive compliments on how well it was run and how the students enjoyed it and it was just a great evening. So I um, just want to say thank you to all the staff who helped out with graduation this year. Lots of students participated and the parents appreciated um, just how good the audience was and they could hear their student's name and it, it all went very well. I want to make sure to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you did mention that because it, it, you're correct. Uh, okay, foundation report. Mr. Uh, Foster. Good evening. I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things uh, that happened in May. Uh, one being the CUS Regatta and I wanted to thank Trustee Nunez for being there, and uh, we had a great event that evening at the CUS pool. We raised $14,321. dollars $1, 1400 boy. Um, we drank it all, though. <laughs> uh, we had a CUS, we had a foundation goal of uh, 15000 so we just came up a little shy of our, of our goal for that. I also wanted to thank uh, Trustee Mann for uh, both initiating and attending the Woodlake CSF uh, uh, celebration that we had. We had 18 students honored and it was in, in conjunction with a Woodlake Rotary Club meeting and so we were able to uh, utilize their venue and their uh, caterer and all those things that uh, make it difficult for us to do the other ones and um, so it was a great event and uh, it allowed us as, a, as COS to reach out into another community um, within our district and celebrate higher education. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Any uh, questions for? Uh... Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Accreditation report. Dr. Lacerna. I Good should afternoon, say. everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me. I'm just going to give you a quick update on where we are with our accreditation work group. We are meeting next week, Dr. Trimble and Superintendent Carasosa and I, to discuss our plan for the year for the accreditation work group. We're going to look at our year-long calendar and look at our timeline and make sure that we have each each component in place for the upcoming year. And al along our calendar is to start drafting our 2018 self-study that we know will be due in the summer of 2018. So we're going to be working on that and getting that underway. And I would expect at an early fall meeting, we'll present you with our timeline for the year and each of the steps that will be taken over that year. OK? Any questions? Questions? Thank you. All right, that would move us to the uh, superintendent president's report, and it looks like we have uh, a lot of uh, nice introductions to make today. I'd like to move over to the podium for just the first part of this superintendent's report. And um, 
remind all of you as a board that we recently held our uh, end of the year um, staff and faculty recognition dinner. It was a wonderful event where we were able to honor our Giant of the Year award recipients. And we have folks who we honor in four different categories, certificated faculty, classified employees, district managers, and community volunteers and supporters. Uh, that evening, unable to make it, was our recipient this year for our Giant of the Year as our community support and volunteer. And so um, we asked if he would be able to attend this evening so that at least under some umbrella of fanfare, he could get recognized. <laughs> and so I want to thank, first of all, the staff in our Student Health Services Office and Department for their nomination this year. You are probably aware one of the most recent and really important projects that we've undertaken is providing um, a food pantry and an opportunity for students who uh, have a difficult time getting uh, enough to eat throughout the course of their day uh, to be able to have a place to get some regular nourishment. So our, um, our food pantry and our food service, our health service staff have um, reached out to the community and one of the folks that they've uh, made great contact with, they invited Mr. Steve Dresser to join our food insecurity task force. This was about three years ago uh, to collaborate on how to promote student success for those on our campus who do uh, suffer from food insecurity. The research from the office revealed here at COS that 40% of our students suffer from some form of food insecurity. Steve came forward, accepted the challenge, and has been a very active member of the Food Insecurity Task Force. Each, mo each month, he provides nutrition on the go, which provides free fruits and vegetables to the students, employees, and community members at the Visalia campus. He's an employee of Foodlink, who also provides weekly staples for our six snack stations on campuses, uh, all free of charge to our students who need additional support and nourishment. Um, our, our health services staff uh, states that they feel very blessed to have the services provided from Steve and from Foodlink. And um, this support has provided many of the nutritional boosts that students have needed to continue to be successful. So tonight, um, because he was unable to make it to our official dinner ceremony, we'd like to take this opportunity before our board and our audience this evening to recognize our Giant of the Year Award winner for Community Member of the Year, Mr. Steve Dresser. Steve, thank you. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. That's a wonderful service. And, uh, you're to be commended. Well, I'd just like to say one thing. You know, we have a great team here with Cynthia and uh, Patty and plus the Food Link staff, and we really enjoy coming here. And I was shocked to uh, find out the need that was present in the student body. Because I was a student here, and uh, I never thought about these issues, but now it, it is a problem. So I'm very uh, thankful that I can be part of it. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I know it's something that I take for granted, but so. Okay, Mr. President, next I'd like to introduce our uh, Vice President of Administrative Services, and then we will start uh, down a series of introductions uh, of faculty as well. But first, uh, Christine Stadden. Good evening, board members. Tonight, I would like to introduce our new Food Services Manager, Zach Patterson. Zachary Patterson is his name, but he goes by Zach. And um, like we enjoy kidding him at the Management Institute, he's a little older than he looks. But uh, he, I, I'll try not to steal all his thunder, but we're really happy to have him. He's a Valley boy, uh, currently living in Kingsburg, a Fresno State grad, and, and lots of years of experience managing Starbucks and even managing a couple at a time. So I'll let him share a little more. Well, it's nice to meet you all. I have spent the last eight and a half years working for Starbucks, six of which in management position. Um, my most recent store was right across the street, so it's not too far of a, a hop across the street to get to get here. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited for the 
the things that we can do at this school. Um, I feel that in my past I can bring a high level of efficiency um, and uh, just a great culture um, to the food services here at COS. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Any, any questions of Zach? Thank where, you. Where did you go oh. to school? Uh, I went to school at Fresno State. But where did you grow up? Here in the Valley also? I grew up in Selma. Okay. Um, born and raised in Selma, and then I lived uh, in Kingsburg, seven minutes away. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome. <laughs> We're hiring millennials, man. What can we say? <laughs> okay, next I'd like to have Dr. Lucerna come up, and she'll facilitate introduction of our faculty. Hello again. I am more than thrilled to be introducing our next, next set of our 18 faculty members that we've hired this year. You met a group of them last time. I think we'll have a couple more in July, and then a few that are coming from across the country or who have not yet been hired that will meet at our August board meeting. So um, I do want to mention that over half of our uh, people you're meeting today are current adjunct of, um, of College of Sequoias, and I'm going to introduce each of the deans to come up and, and talk about them, and um, just so you guys, you guys take a deep breath. You don't have to say anything. You can if you want, but um, just be we'll ready come for up. Questions. But yeah. they may have a question, so don't leave <laughs> until you have a chance for a question. Okay, so up, uh, to introduce our first three faculty members, uh, full-time faculty members in sociology, mathematics, and organic general chemistry is Dr. Techo, our Dean of Math, Science, and Engineering. Board, faculty, and COS community, I'd like to introduce you to, this is Catherine Medrano, who's our new sociologist. Uh, Ryan Fraze, who's our new organic chemist, and, and Chanathuan Chap, who's our new mathematician. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, uh, just reading a few things about uh, Catherine. Just I want to make this comment, that not only for Dr. Otecho, but all of us who come up to speak this evening. We do have an interpreter here providing sign language, and we have some audio devices for our board members, so we need to speak right into the microphone, please. Great. Thank you. Our first person that I'd like to introduce is uh, Catherine. I can stand up over here, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine is a native of Kings County, uh, a Hanford native who graduated from Hanford High School and was its valedictorian the year she graduated. She continued her studies at UC San Diego, where she uh, was a cum laude distinguished graduate in sociology. Uh, she couldn't get that bug out of her, so she continued on into graduate school at the University of California in Santa Barbara, where she continued on with her studies for not only the master's degree, but completed most of her studies for the doctorate in sociology. Catherine is a Jack K. Cook scholar. She's a Gates Millennial <laughs> scholar, and she is also a Ford Foundation fellow, which are recognitions that in academia are, are considered quite exceptional. Uh, in her last academic year, she was been teaching here at Fresno State and at uh, Fresno City College. And uh, what we found very, very attractive about her um, uh, application is she is currently working for Pearson Publishing, where she is teaching faculty throughout the United States how to use uh, digital technology, digital textbooks, to encourage student uh, engagement and student um, um, retention in the classroom. So we're very, very honored to include her and to welcome her to the uh, social sciences faculty. Um, I, w I was told to keep this to about 15 minutes, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, good, because we have 15 minutes of questions. <laughs> um, so, uh, so like the dean said, I grew up in Hanford, and I went to away to school to San Diego and Santa Barbara, and people will say, but you came back? <laughs> It's so hot here, why would you come back to the Central Valley? And it was always my goal to come back to the Central Valley. This is where my family is, and I feel like there's um, you know, a lot of um, issues of access and opportunity that need to be addressed here. And so it was always my goal to come back and to try to work locally in the community and feel like I'm making a difference. And so I'm so honored and grateful for this opportunity to be able to do what I've always wanted to do. So thank you. Um, Chan Tuen is his first name. Chap is his last name. Uh, we, but we all call him Chap. Just because uh, then 
we, um, he's asked us to, to, to address him as Chap. A native of Fresno, Chap was an exceptional mathematician in high school, and he continued his studies at Fresno State for both the bachelor's and master's degree in pure mathematics. He uh, has taught at Fresno City College, COS, and at Fresno State. And uh, this past year, he served as a, as a part, uh, as a non-tenure track mathematician where the students loved him. I'd, uh, we'd go by his office and there was this cubby of students always in there uh, asking questions and he has been very successful as a teacher. He is a son of recent immigrants from Southeast Asia and he has made it a point to mentor students who are first generation and uh, he's hoping to continue on in his task to get more kids that are in first generation in the United States to, uh, to move forward. Um, uh, something interesting about Chap, his hobby, he works on aquaponics. He, uh, it's an interesting fish plant combination where you can work on a sustainable uh, projects to help feed the world. Anyway, welcome Chap. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, being here today. Uh, it's been a pleasure working here at COS. Um, I enjoy teaching students of all different skill levels in math. And it's really been a pleasure working here, motivating and mentoring students. I, I hope to continue to make a difference in their lives. And I, I hope they can you know, achieve their life goals. Thank you. I have somebody in Tulare that uh, was telling me how interested they are in aquaponics. So uh, I'm going to take your name down and uh, put him in contact. <laughs> Uh, don't forget to visit my YouTube page. Okay. <laughs> I think you're, you're, you're assuming I can navigate. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say to to Mr. Nunes, YouTube, that's a site on the internet. <laughs> you can log it in on his phone before you leave. <laughs> well, I, I just uh, learned that Chap raises fish. Uh, Catherine has raised uh, children and two turtles. <laughs> and our, our, our newest cat candidate, Ryan Fraze, raises turkeys. <laughs> uh, he comes from a turkey farm in, in, in Fresno County, so he, where uh, his family has a fairly large operation there. Uh, Ryan Fraze is, uh, is a native of the Dinuba area, and uh, as I mentioned, his family has a farm there. And uh, he attended Reedley College before and got the chemistry bug there and studied chemistry at San Luis Obispo where he's dis distinguished himself as a biochemist. He continued on his studies as a teacher, which is something he always wanted to do. So he took his teaching credential at Fresno Pacific University and continued his master's uh, degree at, in chemistry at Fresno State University. Over the past couple of academic years, he has taught at Clovis North High School. He has taught at uh, Edison High School and got his, um, his experience at community college at Clovis Community College in in, uh, for the uh, State Center Community College District. Uh, Ryan brings a wealth of scientific knowledge and, uh, and teaching experience to the college. And uh, we're looking forward to having him on several committees because he's already been on an SLO committee at, uh, at, Fres at State Center. So welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Um, I am really excited to be here as well. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I grew up in this area and I was educated in science at the community college level and I really look forward to helping more students have access to um, really challenging research and, and chemistry experience at the community college level so they can successfully transfer and excel at the further levels and accomplish what they want to accomplish. So thank you very much. Thank you. Average age, 29. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little bit maybe. younger. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, our next two full-time faculty members are in culinary and physical therapy assistant, and I'm gonna ask their dean, Cindy Delane, to come up and introduce them. Good afternoon. Let's see, Sarah, come on, come on closer. First, I'm gonna introduce Sarah. Sarah is our culinary, new culinary instructor, which we're so excited to have. Uh, she attended UC Davis and graduated from California State University at Northridge, where she received her bachelor's degree in home economics and business. 
She has managed and or own, owned her own restaurants since 2004, so a great background in culinary, as you can see. Currently, she is co-owner of Maru Restaurant in Visalia and has served in the culinary business at all levels, including management, management and head chef. Now, the most fun thing I had, I have to say, after all these years in doing interviews, the teaching demo in culinary is by far the most fun. I know now what I've done to hollandaise sauce to ruin it. So I can't wait to try that again. Um, a little too hot, I guess, is what I've been doing, and the whole thing just separates. So what it was just so much fun to uh, observe her in her teaching demo, and she is bringing with her lots of excitement. This is her first experience in teaching, but she has such a great background in culinary, in business, in management, in restaurants, that we think she's going to do a great job. So with that, I introduce Sarah. And thank you so much for having me. And I hope to um, bring culinary arts to some excitement, exciting levels for the students. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Joe Souza. Come on up. <laughs> Such an unusual name. <laughs> <laughs> Joe began his education at the University of the Pacific with a bachelor's degree in sports medicine and spent the next five years in Washington working as an aide while he explored computer work. So he has a great knowledge in computer technology. In 2010, he completed his doctorate of physical therapy at Sacred Heart University. He's been adjuncting for us in the PTA program since 2011. During that time, he was instrumental in leading the implementation of our new non-credit rehab PT aid program, which started through a grant. And during this time, because of his knowledge of technology that we're very thankful for, because we can always go to Joe, he created an uh, electronic textbook for students that's open, what they call open source. So students don't have to pay for the textbook. They can just go on to the open source site and read what they need to read. So he was instrumental in pulling all that together. Very successful program because of him. And we have now institutionalized that at COS. And we have 30 students in that PT aid program this summer, which is a career pathway to physical therapy assistant and then eventually physical therapy. So we welcome Joe as he brings a great knowledge, experience, and I'm very thankful for his technological computer skills. I'm just very thankful. Um, I, was a, I am a Valley boy, born and raised in Tulare. And I actually taken a couple classes at COS. And I'm uh, going to do a little nostalgia, because I remember this classroom taking public speaking with all the computer stuff. Um, and I started as adjunct. And I'm very happy to transition from full-time clinician to full-time faculty. Joe doesn't know this, but I was the flower girl in his mom's wedding, so now I'm feeling Oh, my old. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was, so you can tell your mom and dad. Your, and I think your dad was maybe the best man. Uh, my dad was the best man in your dad's wedding. I just haven't seen you since you were uh, much younger. <laughs> I don't carry the Portuguese family tree with me. <laughs> you know, like it or not, I'm sure your dad tells you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, they, they do remind me all of the time. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, several of the positions that we've hired this year were replacement for retiring folks, and some have been expansions. So as you know, we had a big loss this year with our choir director, uh, Jeff Seward, leaving, and so we're excited to be introducing a new choir director. And for the first time in, I'm guessing, 
15 years, we are presenting a full-time American Sign Language instructor. And again, first time that we have a full-time person in that position in 15 years. And then we had a late retirement in the library, so we weren't able to do a permanent replacement through the ranking process, but we were able to have a full-time one-year temporary position in um, Information Competency Librarian, and we'll be introducing that position as well. So I'm inviting Stephanie Collier, our Dean of Arts and Letters, to present and introduce you. Good evening. Um, I'm going to go a little out of order, and I'm going to introduce Annette Klein, who is our brand new full-time American Sign Language instructor. Uh, we are just beyond thrilled to have Annette joining our team. Um, Annette has been working at Fresno State for more than 15 years, teaching full-time up there. Um, so we were really excited to steal her away from them. Um, and I think the thing that David and I are most excited about is um, not just is she going to be a fantastic teacher, when she did her teaching demo, she could teach David, which is saying a lot. <laughs> uh, he really is the worst ASL student we've ever, <laughs> we've ever seen. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but not only is she going to be amazing in the classroom, but she's going to help to revitalize um, a, a missing component at College of the Sequoias, which is our uh, deaf culture, um, inform you know, teaching us more about deaf culture, bringing deaf culture events. And so we're just really uh, pleased for that. So it's gonna be a transition for us, um, but it's gonna be a really good one and we're just really thrilled to have her. So this is Annette Klein, our new American Sign Language instructor. Okay, thank you for having me here at CLS. I am looking forward to becoming part of the team, as was said before, and making an ASL program and expanding it and just revitalizing everything. So thank you. Next. Oh, we're gonna do the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Emily Campbell, and as Jennifer, uh, Dr. Lacerna mentioned, um, this uh, uh, Emily is serving as a one-year full-time uh, position with the retirement of uh, long-term librarian Gina Haycock. Um, Emily has a lot of community experience. She's worked uh, at the Fresno Community Libraries in various capacities, brings a lot of knowledge to that and has been serving for this past year as one of our adjunct librarians and has been doing a wonderful job both teaching our courses and also um, in her library capacities. I know she's been the liaison for the math and science departments um, and helping them to keep our library up current in that area. Um, one of the really great things about Emily is that she came through the community college system and she's always had a passion to give back to the community college students. And so now she's getting that opportunity and we're just really blessed to have her. And um, we hope that when we eventually, hopefully next year, get a full-time position, she will reapply. So this is Emily Campbell. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, as Stephanie said, I um, did come through the community college system. I am from uh, Madera County. I went to Merced College. Um, and I'm really passionate about teaching information literacy skills at the community college level. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> Yay. John emailed me and said, is it good if I wear my suit? And I said, yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> just goes to show, I think, the, uh, just what kind of person John's going to be. And really, I feel like I should let you introduce him, Stan, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> as Jennifer also mentioned, we uh, had a huge loss with the retirement of Mr. Seward, but I'm feeling very confident that we are um, bringing in somebody who's going to continue to grow the program of choir, uh, the music program and the choir program, uh, leaving off where Mr. Se or starting up where Mr. Seward left off. Uh, John comes to us from El Diamante. 
note, this is the second uh, faculty person we stole from El Diamante, so Mr. Sherman, you might need to do a little... Uh, I've already had the... Yes. <laughs> 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 so uh, we're really thrilled because uh, we already, he and Mr. Tackett, who uh, is the band director, already have a wonderful relationship, so they're just kind of taking off from where they left at El Diamante. Um, I know that uh, Chris Magnus has already cornered John and said, let's uh, talk about a music theater uh, certificate or uh, AA or something. So he's got a lot of great ideas. He's going to work really well with that department, and we're just very excited to have him. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm just uh, eternally excited to be here. And uh, I started at Reedley College. and. Um, met my voice teacher and choir director Clark Scogsworth who changed my life. And so the reason I'm so excited about being here is because I've always wanted to have the opportunity to do that for other students. And uh, I just think this is an amazing place to be. COS will be, will continue to be wonderful and I hope to bring even more musical successes to this community. So I'm excited to see all of you at the concerts. <laughs> and musicals. Thank you so Welcome. much. Well, thank you all so much uh, uh, for being with us today. And before we move on to the next part of uh, the agenda, those that were introduced may want to take this opportunity yeah. to, uh, 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 if you would like, to uh, exit the room. And it looks like you're uh, taking that opportunity and doing just that. Tell the big guy to sit down. The rest of you have to, unfortunately, the rest of you have to stay. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, reports under item 7, uh, Academic Senate Report. I don't see Dr. Uh, Tremble here today, so uh, we probably don't have a report. Is that correct? No report. Okay. Uh, Costa President Report, uh, Mr. Uh, Tidwell. I'll be very brief. Uh, this is my first chance to speak before you. Uh, I took over as Costa President right at the end of the last school year, so we'll be seeing a fair amount of each other as the, uh, as the year develops. Uh, just a quick, uh, and I know that uh, President Carrizo has, has certainly kept you up to date on our activities this summer, uh, but I just wanted to maybe ratify and, uh, and uh, uh, underscore some of what I'm sure you've heard from him. And that is first and foremost that we are, we're very glad that the faculty voted to set aside what's become known as the COLA grievance uh, that was deeply troubling the faculty right at the end of the school year. And faculty did overwhelmingly decided that they wanted to set that aside and go on to uh, uh, begin to discuss a new contract. And uh, that really did set the stage in a very positive way for the discussions that have resulted. Uh, we put together a very, very good team. Uh, our, uh, our chief negotiator for the faculty uh, has worked for a number of years with the uh, chief negotiator for the uh, for the district uh, or your co-chief negotiator, if I call it that. Uh, so we've we've established a good working relationship. Uh, another thing that's that's been I think gratifying to me is that uh, though we maybe got off to a, a, a rocky start, there's been a great deal of faculty interest uh, in negotiations, and we actually uh, have enough faculty interest that we have rotating observers coming through and sitting in the actual negotiating sessions. Uh, ne negotiation sessions, and that's worked very, very well. And I think it's taken away some of the, uh, it's taken away some of the romance of negotiation, is what it's done. <laughs> we've we've heard from folks after each of our sessions. Wow, that goes slow. Uh, <laughs> and indeed, it's painstaking. Uh, and I think uh, for people on, on the outside, you know, we're not sitting around around table smoking cigars, and uh, it's 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 real work. Uh, and we look forward to getting back to that work tomorrow. Uh, We've had real productive meetings, amazingly productive meetings, I think, uh, and discussions. Uh, and we've uh, thus far dealt with, uh, with health care. Uh, and a number of early articles have been discussed, I think, very, very productively. Uh, the tone and tenor of the discussions, I think, has been extraordinarily positive and extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, and more important than that, I think out of that tone and tenor, what's happening is that we're, we're really developing an understanding of the goals both of the district and the faculty. Uh, we're developing a respect for one another's language uh, that uh, coming out of the English department I certainly appreciate, but care has to be taken there. And I think we're learning also that as we take care with the language, we're establishing a kind of trust that has not maybe been, been present in previous negotiations. Uh, and all of that I think is extraordinarily positive, not just for this round of negotiations, 
but um, you know, moving beyond this into the future, I think it's very, very positive. Um, we look forward to continuing the process that we've established and uh, working together toward uh, final language, which seems uh, like a very good possibility, uh, and ultimately toward ratification and uh, on with life. So thank you all very much, and thank you uh, for your involvement. We know that you are discussing this outside of, uh, of our negotiations. And again, we, we appreciate the tone and tenor, and uh, uh, the productivity is, is enormously gratifying for us thus far. So we'll keep it up. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm not sure since I've been on the board that I've ever heard it described as uh, negotiations uh, by the word, by the romance uh, word. <laughs> I think it's okay. An enormously gratifying <laughs> to you, I like that. We've never heard those words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the English term. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, CSEA report, Mr. Lamar. I would just quickly like to say that uh, I hope that this Wednesday is going to be enormously gratifying for CSEA as well. <laughs> but not romantic. <laughs> so far, it's not been romantic. Maybe romantic is still. But uh, we meet this Wednesday. We had a good positive meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, so we're really looking forward. Hopefully, we can come, uh, come up with a tentative this Wednesday. We're meeting from 1 to 5 o'clock. So as I say, we're very optimistic and positive the way things have been going. Uh, last thing I just wanted to say, this semester has left CSEA with a very heavy heart. First, as you know, we lost Terry Gray suddenly, and we just lost our computer tech, Frank Feliciano. Two extremely fine gentlemen, very close to most of our classified, very popular individuals. So it's, it's been a hard semester, so it's a rugged road we've been leaving, but hopefully next semester we can take off and maybe as a new contract. Thank you, Steve. All right, Mr. Nickel, COSAFA report. Thank you. All right, item made, information. Uh, college and career uh, access pathways agreement with uh, University Pre Preparatory High School. I moved my seat closer, fighting with uh, Ms. Statton about who's going to be up here more often today. Um, OK, so this, if you recall at our last board meeting, I talked about these uh, college and career access pathways agreements that we're required to have for dual, we're not required, we have the two options for dual enrollment, the current model that we have, or the new CCAP agreements. And last board meeting, I presented two to you, which are on for action this week with VTech and um, Toy Joint Union High School District. So this is the third one that we're bringing forward, and this agreement is with University Preparatory High School. It's on for a information item today, and will be on for action in July. And again, what these allow us is with the new legislation is to be able to restrict these courses, uh, to allow the, the high schools to have a closed campus, which is uh, they don't have to have other students besides their students in those classes. And it allows us both to collect apportionment and uh, FTES for those co courses. So we have this uh, agreement with University Preparatory High School in front of you as an information item. And we're looking mostly at American Sign Language, Spanish, and music courses. And then we will um, bring that forward for a, a action item next meeting. OK, thank you, Dr. Lucerna. Do we have any uh, comments or questions on that particular item? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. An item may be removed from the consent calendar at the request of any member of the Board of Trustees or any person in the audience and considered as a separate agenda items. All right, do we have any items on the consent calendar two through 10 that need to be acted on separately. I move we approve the consent calendar. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval of the consent calendar. Uh, any uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, action items uh, starting with uh, Item 11, curriculum. It's recommended that the board approve the curriculum 
report that's presented in front of you. We have several items. On the first page, we have deletions of courses that are being deleted for repeatability or no longer uh, being offered. Page two, we have modified courses that are here for five-year review. Page three, we have um, more modifications, some textbook updates, mostly um, five-year reviews. Uh, the same on page four, there's minor revision, updating textbooks for several courses that were up for five-year review. Page five is, again, more modified courses, uh, two- and five-year updates. Page six is also modified courses for um, five-year review, uh, combining a couple courses. And page seven is more modifications. Again, all five-year reviews. You can see they got their five-year reviews all done at the end of the semester, so we can get them here. And also on page eight, complete the five-year reviews for courses. On page eight, we have one new course that is uh, Music 188. And page nine begins our programs. And so there's, uh, no, those are courses again, sorry. The Police Academy modules, there's three modifications to units for the three Police Academy modules. And on the last page, page 10, we have modifications, uh, CTE review, two-year review, um, a new associate degree for transfer in chemistry, and modifications to computer programming uh, two program, computer programming courses, uh, programs, I apologize, and on the last page, a modification for our plant science uh, degree. It's recommended that this uh, report be approved. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, curriculum uh, report. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. All right, you're still up. Item 12 and 13. If it's okay, I'll, if, I guess I can, I'll just present them together and y'all decide sure. how to vote. But um, the, these are the two uh, CCAP agreements that were brought to you as information items at the last board meeting. The first is with um, Visalia, uh, no, the first with Tillery Joint Union High School District and the second with Visalia Technical Early College. Again, they are as I described earlier, agreements based on the new uh, legislation allowing us to offer these courses at the high schools and keep those um, closed just to their students allows us to restrict them and register their students first and it also allows us to um, both groups to collect a por collect apportionment for those courses apportionment at the high school and, and um, uh, FTS for us. So I would recommend, or we are recommending that we approve both of these agreements. Okay, do we have any questions? I, uh, just, I have a quick question, and it, I guess it's maybe not directly related to this, but it is. Is the Accelerated Charter High School, are the students that go there going to be there 100% of the time? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay, so that is going to be its own campus. Separate site. Full time. Yep. They'll get everything <clears throat> they need there. That's how okay. it's been explained to okay. us. Okay. And so what we're gonna be providing through these dual enrollment agreements are opportunities for the full-time students who are there to have College of the Sequoias classes as part of their high school curriculum. Got it, okay, understood. Okay, so uh, I think we should uh, act on each one of these separately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so I'll uh, entertain a motion on uh, item 12 first. So moved. No second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the uh, College and Career Access Pathways Agreement with Tulare Joint Union High School District. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, then item 13. Why move we approve item 13? Second. We have a motion and a second by Earl with regards to the College and Career Pathways Agreement with uh, Visalia Technical Early College. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 14, Mr. Bratch. The Warriors are tipping off in five minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be done. With no this, pressure. <laughs> Let's see. That's okay, uh, uh, Greg. You, you can catch the next game on uh, Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 
For the most part at COS, we employ managers through an employment contract or via an express appointment. The president and vice presidents are employed through an actual employment agreement uh, specifying the terms of their employment. However, all the other managers are appointed in their position for one year, from July 1st through June 30th. It's that time of year where we are again appointing our managers other than vice presidents and superintendents to their appointment. So tonight we have in front of you a resolution appointing our managers to this one year appointment. And I would ask that you ratify this, this resolution or approve this resolution. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second for the uh, approval um, the appointments of educational and classified administrators. Uh, let's see, would you please pull the board? Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Zumwalt? Aye. Trustee Mann? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. Thank you very much. Resolution 2016-08 uh, is adopted. John, you're also on tap for item 15. Since I've been here at COS since 2004, we've had five presidents. And each time we have a presidential recruitment, we start from scratch by creating a, a job flyer for the individual recruitment. This is something that hasn't uh, gone unnoticed, and it was really brought to uh, the board's attention during this last round of evaluations of our current superintendent. It was requested that uh, we to clear this, this issue by creating a base job description and creating a base salary for our superintendent position to serve as a starting point in future recruitments for a superintendent rather than starting from scratch each time. So over the past couple of months, uh, several staff members as well as several board of trustees members created a, the job description that is in front of you uh, on item number 15. Also within this job description is a salary range. Now this salary range was, was, came about by comparing the other chancellors and superintendents and presidents in our surrounding community colleges. And the result is what we have in front of you, which is the, uh, the new president superintendent job description. And I would ask that the board uh, approve this job description and salary structure for upcoming presidential recruitments to serve as a starting point. Uh, John, thank you very much for uh, putting that into uh, context. Uh, in that regard, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the work of, uh, of uh, Mr. Calvin and uh, board member uh, Zumwalt in uh, the time that they, uh, time and effort that they spent on uh, putting this document together. And uh, I would also uh, would, uh, would think that uh, this document would be uh, something that we would look to from time to time and, uh, and revise uh, as needed as we do uh, other items such as board policies, administrative policies, and no such a thing. So uh, any other comments from any other board members? No John, one. Dr. Zom uh, John, Dr. Zomo, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> See, you've got a, a race comes with that too. <laughs> yeah, you got double my salary. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Mr. Brass described the, the purpose of this, but from the board perspective, it has a greater purpose than that. Uh, first of all, it amazes me that we went 80 years without having a description of the job duties of the superintendent president. The only person on the whole campus that doesn't have a description. Of and since he's the only one that works the board, it kind of tells you about the past competence of the board, not having to take care of this before now. But um, this serves other purposes as well. You know, um, uh, the board regularly evaluates a superintendent president, but that evaluation is not a public document. And nowhere can the public look at some document and know what is expected of the superintendent president. Uh, this, this document we prepared uh, has a lot of those things in, in there, which also then helps this board and future boards uh, uh, evaluate how well our superintendent does and also to, as people retire and, and things change, to help the next person know what to look for. Also, from personal experience, one of the most difficult things to do when you hire a new superintendent 
is how much should they be paid? And, uh, trust me, it is a horrible struggle to figure that out. Well, we looked at a lot of the, the areas around us, and one thing that kind of struck me is that somebody else had actually picked it up, I think it was Brent, that uh, if you take the total cost of our administration at this college compared to our neighbors, we're like half of what the others are, and in some cases less than half, which tells me we have a, a management team that uh, knows their business, gets the job done, and clearly works very hard. Uh, uh, also was sort of struck by, at least why since we're now talking about the superintendent position, is how poorly paid our superintendent was compared to those around us. And should he ever retire, uh, then uh, uh, the difficulty in recruiting somebody of, of the type, of the caliber that uh, this district deserves, and to give the board some flexibility to do that sort of thing. So it serves lots of things, you know, it tells the public what we expect, is part of a yardstick for the superintendent to read about what we expect, and uh, uh, and, it's, and 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 I am positive, as, as Ken talked about, is that we'll review this thing regularly, probably at least every time that the contract is visited with the superintendent, and perhaps often, like every time he's evaluated it. Maybe over the next two, three years, we'll end up with the, even a much better document. So it's a it's a multi-purpose thing, not just the thing, not just what you put forward. I agree with everything John said, and I look forward to. We also talked about, um, you know, establishing um, the procedure for hiring um, our president superintendent, and a lot of a lot of effort and work goes into that, and I think it needs to be laid out. You know, I think every board will maybe do it a little bit different, but in general, the general guidelines and. You know, Greg, you talked about that. I think it's important to kind of hand that over to the next board, those of us that are aren't here, in order to um, make that process go smoother. Because with each board, I'm sure there's things that get implemented that worked that were good, and some that maybe didn't need to be done. And I think if it's written down, it would be a good tool for the for the next board that has to hire our next president. So look forward to doing working on that document and, and, as well. And, and, and I don't mean to be negative. Don't, don't take in, it. Don't be anything into this. But when you list expectations in this description of what a good superintendent can do, it ends up being a yardstick to enable the board to help the superintendent be better if necessary, uh, or maybe it enables the superintendent to get ahead, ahead of the board and, and, and do it for himself. So. I agree. All right, anybody else? Earl, your, your uh, sound system's working good today, I think. Great. All right, so uh, I would uh, Accept a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second for approval of the base uh, job description and base salary guidelines for the position of the superintendent president. Uh, any uh, other discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you uh, once again for your work. All right, uh, Mr. Bratch, are you still up? I have one more. We have item 16, approval of employment agreement between the district and the fire technology coordinator. <clears throat> As I mentioned a few moments ago, one of the ways in which we can employ a manager here on campus is to provide an actual written employment agreement. While we generally reserve those written employment agreements to our superintendent and our vice presidents, on an occasion we do need to have an actual written employment agreement for a particular manager. In this case, our fire technology coordinator, Rick Smith, who was hired earlier in the uh, spring semester, has a unique work schedule in that his hours really fluctuate. He, he's a part-time employee, and de depending on the day of the week, the, the month, or the semester, his hours are really gonna vary. And it just didn't make sense to have him employed on a annual appointment, annual appointment, but rather have him fill out a monthly timesheet. And what this employment agreement is specifying that, that he is considered an employee of the college and he's entitled to uh, all the benefits of being a, a manager here at the college, but he is going to be filling out a monthly timesheet to reflect the hours he worked. And so with that, I would ask that the board formally approve the employment agreement between the college and uh, Rick Smith, our fire technology coordinator. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second for the uh, approval of the employment agreement for 
Fire Technology Coordinator. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Bratch. All right, that would get us to uh, item 17, consolidation of governing uh, board elections. This is a resolution. Yes, Mr. President, this is uh, a resolution that we revisit each um, election cycle in our um, general election cycle, and it speaks specifically to the elections for College of the Sequoias Community College District Board of Trustees in wards three and four. We are required by resolution to um, call for those elections to be consolidated and carried out in the November general election. And uh, we received this from the county office as one of those perfunctory documents and actions for us to complete. And so uh, it's before you tonight so that we can um, take that appropriate action and it would then enable our trustee uh, trustees from wards three and four um, to be uh, elected at the next regularly scheduled general election in November. Saves us a lot of money too. It absolutely does. So move. Second. second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of resolution 216-09. Would you please poll the board? Trustee Gilmore. Aye. Trustee Sherman. Aye. Trustee Cardoza. Aye. Trustee Mann. Aye. Trustee Aye. Uh, motion, uh, uh, resolution. Uh, 2016-09 is unanimously adopted. All right, that would move us to the uh, item uh, 18, the lease agreement uh, for the uh, Tulare CTE. Okay, this is uh, somewhat of a unique item, but we want to present before you tonight a lease agreement between uh, our community college district and the uh, other party is Danny and Connie McElmoyle, co-trustees co of the 2006 McElmoyle Family Trust. Kind of a long name. And what, we're, what we are trying to do here um, is procure some building facilities in Tulare for our CTE and industry and technology needs that may be coming in the near future. And Stan, uh, President Carrizosa, sorry, and I can kind of tag team on this. Uh, he might want to give you the overarching idea of why we're pursuing this, and then I have some of the logistics in the um, lease agreement itself that I can share with you. Is that sure. This, this is a unique item, and I guess I would um, start by asking you to think about this as a form of um, insurance, if you will, kind of an insurance policy on being able to provide the facilities needed for these elements of our career technical education programs to continue to be provided and serve students without interruption. It takes a little bit of context to go back to the history of the passage of the Measure I bond funding for the Visalia campus. And you will recall at the time that we passed that bond and we did all of our Visalia campus work and modernization, that there were a couple of projects um, that were approved but not funded. One of those is the demolition and the reconstruction of what we now know as the Buckeye Building, and that's the building where the old, on this campus where the older career technical education programs operated. Currently, I think there's still electricity and construction trades in there. Um, that might not be exactly right, but it's, it, are neither of them right, Dad? Industrial maintenance in and HVAC. Okay, and so those programs operating in there um, <coughs> have needed that space because remember the longer term plan was when the Tulare campus was built and complete, which would include phase two, um, the remainder of those CTE facilities on the Tulare campus, then the existing programs that are currently still on the Visalia campus would relocate there. Um, now that the um, state construction bond is approved to be placed on the ballot for November, we are anticipating um, the outcome of that election. Should the election uh, be successful and that facilities bond be passed, we have a fully funded project to construct the demolition and the reconstruction of that Buckeye building. 
which would mean as soon as November, we would know that our planning would need to begin to relocate our existing CTE programs out of that Visalia location to another location. We know that we can't put them on the Tulare campus because the project for phase two for Tulare is not yet scoring high enough to be eligible for funding. And it may be a few years before it does. And we may need a local match. So we've got a lot of variables on the Tulare campus. We know in the past when we haven't been proactive, when we haven't been anticipatory, we've set ourselves up to have our programs be scattered to storefronts <coughs> and distributed at different locations at the last minute. And so it was my decision to have staff actually take some of the one-time money we have right now and invest in a little insurance policy by setting up ourselves into a lease agreement with this facility who is vacated, who has been reviewed by our dean and our vice president and our provost, and they feel like it would be a very um, adequate facility for the relocation of those CTE programs from Visalia. It, it, it happens that this facility is in Tulare, so it gets them into Tulare, and then they have a tentative home for the three, five, however many more years needed um, until we can get the Tulare campus finished so that we don't delay all of the work on the Visalia campus for that transition to occur. What it does on the Visalia campus is it allows us to demolish the current Buckeye building and rebuild it, and you'll remember that is going to be a new multi-use facility for basic skills. And so with all of the services that we're expanding in the college right now, and the fact that we've got this funding, a fully funded project waiting for us, we didn't want to fall to the bottom of the line and lose that. So it is a pre-investment. I think the layperson would look at this and go, wait, the college is going to spend some money leasing the building but not move in right away. The answer to that question is yes. However, as soon as November, we'll know whether we need to start planning to move or whether we can retreat from the lease. And we won't need to move if there isn't going to be funding in the near future. Are we locked in, though, for a year? Uh, yeah. We the, would. Minimum is for, the minimum is for one year. Yeah. So we had to at least accept the, the investment in that much. And that's why I said think of it as our insurance policy. For me, Lori, that possibility that we might be paying for a full year for something that we didn't need <coughs> was outweighed by the fact that if we do need it, moving those programs with the equipment and the, and the technical aspects of moving it and having to do that quickly and scatter them like we have in the past, this was worth the extra insurance investment from my perspective. Okay. Where is it? Um, so we could get into some of the technical. In your attachment, well, on the first page, page three, it describes it. There is 165 West Cross, so it's where Cross meets North I Street. North I, yeah. And the very last attachment is, is our attempt at an aerial. And the very large corner there on West Cross and actually North H is that large building. We tried to circle them. It doesn't show up real well. And then the second one down on I is circled, and then there's another small building, two more down. I don't know where the picture is. You see it in, your, in the package, John. It should be right there. Which ones are you renting? Christine? Right there. Oh, it's the whole thing. This doesn't have to be. Did they have their business there, don't they? No, they closed. They did? They're out of business. These that are circled right here, Lori? Yes. Okay. I, no, I know where it's at. I just okay. didn't know they were out of it. Now they can just ask John, my question. John, if you're familiar with the, uh, the TDS Hall in Tulare on the corner of... Uh, yeah, I I I get a picture of it. It's right to the west and south of that. Yeah. What's the total square footage? Well, let me go. Let me take you briefly to uh, section three on on page three of this agreement. Um, section three premises. I have two small errors that I need to include in there that'll make it make sense. Total square footage. I haven't added it all up, but the large building is 4,800 square feet HVAC refrigeration shop building. That includes a 1,000 square feet plus or minus office building and one 2,400 square foot butler building. Then when you get um, to, let's see, that's all on one acre on 165 West Cross Street. Then the next building is one approximately 5,000 square foot shop building and an approximate 2,000 square foot office space. That's at 445 North I Street in Tulare. And then lastly, there's one 1,800 square foot building, and it should say including plus or minus 500 square feet of office space and a handicapped bathroom. 
So I apologize. I haven't added those all up. This is the entire facility, correct? The owners aren't, aren't uh, maintain aren't uh, keeping but any part of that. Like it is everything that on, they go. own. They just are not all completely yeah. adjoining. That's just empty railroad tracks and there's a big right. walkway for the trail. And um, a couple other nuances that I'll mention to you. There is um, some wonderful equipment, and I think it is referred to as sheet metal welding equipment that's really almost new. Thad has looked at it, and it um, would be donated to us with the five-year lease agreement if we so chose to move forward with a five-year. So we agreed to kind of this insurance policy for one year if you approve it, and then the five-year, we would then commit to a five-year also at 9,500 a month, and there's, they're gonna take care of grounds, um, and we're gonna take care of utilities, and all of that is spelled out in here. But um, the five-year would allow us to actually move our programs in there and utilize that while we're, we're we basically are taking down Buckeye and General Grant, building that additional building here. And because of the way our, um, I don't know if, Mr. Woods will get into this later. But the way our <coughs> movement, now that, now that Hanford's a center, a lot of those FTES that were counting toward Tulare are now counting toward Hanford. So our Tulare, um, basically our eligibility has dropped from close to 100% down to about 50%. So it's gonna be quite a few years before we build Tulare um, enrollment back up to where we can have the state fund that phase two, unless we. So the them. plan is to stay there though until it moves to Tulare, or will there be space to move that program back to Visalia, or no? No, that's it's the to find a tentative home for it to be until we can build in Tulare. Okay. And the owners wanted us to maybe commit to ten years, and we we did five to be a little more conservative on that. And but he would be very open to. We we as actually long as we got approved for this construction, demolition and reconstruction of the Buckeye lorry based on making that change. We had to obsolete that building for its career technical yeah, it's purposes. Got to go to so we have, if, if we aren't going to this site, we're going somewhere else. But when we take advantage of building in Visalia, to we're gonna build basic skills. Got it. Nothing so that we that. felt like it was the right thing to do to at least be in the same city. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, it could be an annex campus for a while. We've got a pretty good, Deal. I mean, I know it's a hundred plus thousand dollars a year, but if you look back, we paid more than that on ban interest yeah. for yep. construction that didn't do half as much for us. Yeah. So I feel like at least we're getting, if we actually move in here, we're getting the facility we need to run industrial maintenance HVAC programs um, that are going to be expensive to find somewhere else. If we go to a storefront, we're going to have to retrofit those. Mm -hmm. Can we buy the buildings? They're not looking to sell them right now, but we're in. We can get into the lease and then. I don't know that we want to buy them, Greg, because we're going to build in Tulare. But can you, uh, have you done, you haven't, oh, we're going to approve the lease today yeah. then, is yes. that what we're doing? Yes, so yeah. a one-year lease. You can't put in there, you know, first right of refusal if they decide to sell it or something. Well, we can't, we can do anything we want when we renew this after a year. Then we have the opportunity to look at how and it, we'll know in November if it, we did a right. smart deal or not. Right. I think it's a smart deal either way. Okay. We'll know in November whether, because we bought the insurance. I mean, is having insurance on your family and your car a smart deal? Even though something hasn't gone wrong? Of yeah. course it is. Especially if so, you need it. Yeah, so I think having the protection is the smart deal. We'll know in November how quickly we're gonna either cut our losses or prepare to move yes. forward. Right. Tell, tell me again, repeat yourself please, about if the bond passes or doesn't pass, well, how that affects us? If the bond passes, we have a fully funded project for COS, but it requires getting the existing programs we have out of the Visalia campus buildings. This, John, is the new temporary home for those Visalia campus programs until we get approval for the Tulare project. And as Christine just said, Byron could answer questions, but we're, we're a few years away from the enrollment getting us high enough on the eligibility list for that phase two in Tulare to be built. Okay. So we have to, we're going to have to have a temporary home for our, in, our industrial maintenance and HVAC anyway. And we need that much square footage. Yes. It's about 15,000 square feet. I'm, I'm looking at our academic side of the house so here. So you're asking, do we need that much? Um, it depends on how we're utilizing it. So Buckeye currently holds HVAC, industrial maintenance, and half of our construction, construction right. uh, program. So there is a little bit more than those 
just those two programs. Right. Um, it also had the versatility to to help us with our training resource center and some of their classroom needs. Probably the biggest advantage, in my opinion, is that it's a fully functioning HVAC and sheet metal shop, which means it's wired, it has sufficient power, it has compressed air, it has welding facilities. Yeah. It's a it's a working shop that we could roll into and as quickly as we could move equipment in, it would be up and running without. I'm gonna pass around a few pictures that might help you. <coughs> uh, they are from the owner. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't think I need it. I'm gonna approve I'm gonna move we approve. Well, one, one other issue I share with you is that from what I hear, the, the bond is polling really well. The wild card is, you know, the governor opposes it. Mm -hmm. And is he going to oppose it with both feet or just give a lip service? We don't know. But it looks good, from what I understand. Yeah, and that's the reason we wanted to be proactive, John. Mm -hmm. They've it, shrunk the size of it enough that I think even if the governor just winks and turns the other way, there's enough community support because it's gotten small enough. That's why it's pulling better. There's one other small technical change. Can I just a point of order really quick that we do have a we do have a motion on the right. floor. Yeah. Oh, How about I second and then we can go back yeah. to discussion? Yeah. Second. Okay. okay, we do have a motion and a second. So okay. Okay. Uh, just on page nine I changed the name Danny McElmoyle under notices and under the signature to Danny and Connie McElmoyle co trustees. As you approve. Okay, thank you. All right, any uh, Further discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of, of, of approval of the lease? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, Ms. Statton is uh, on for the next item uh, report on the tentative budget. Here we go. Is it now warm? You, yeah. Think yeah. It is? Go yeah, go ahead. You can okay, is it too warm? I'll, I'll adjust okay. the temp. Go ahead. Okay. See, we don't want to. We don't want to. Yeah, we. This. This, is, <laughs> this is exciting stuff. Besides, I hear there's a game that already started. Uh, tonight we have our budget book, which you have received in color. We have extra copies out here if anyone else would like to receive one. And then I have a PowerPoint presentation that, that presents it a little, in a little more detail. It's a lot of slides. I'll try and go through it fairly fast. But this is our budget for next year. First off, big thanks to Linda McCauley, uh, Leangela Miller-Hernandez, and then Karen Pauls, who actually assembles our budget book. And, and we, they put in a lot of long hours, and then I just get to present it. Actually, I do participate too. But anyway, so I want to start by saying this is good news. Um, we are in a good year, we're healthy, we're strong, and you're going to see a, a, a strong, healthy surplus, which is a really good place to be at this point in time. So our tentative budget, where we are on this map is just step two. You'd think we'd be further along, but we're bringing the tentative budget, which authorizes the expenditures over summer. We'll get a final budget a little later in summer, and then we'll bring back the final budget to you in September. And the tentative budget, what are the assumptions? What make it up? 2% access growth is what it's available throughout the state. We could earn as much as 3.2%, which would be great. But this budget only includes 10 more than we have brought to you tonight in our, our latest budget. Mm -hmm. It only moves it up 10. And that was for a cosmetology, what you, what you approved earlier in consent. We're going to increase uh, that budget by 50000 so that we can have 10 more full-time students there. And likewise, we will have another 50000 in revenue coming in. Then we have the UNCOLA, we call it. So we had a 0.47% and they moved it to zero. So that wasn't, fortunately it wasn't a huge loss when you're only getting a 0.47%. Um, we did get an increased base funding. So on top of the fact that we ran last year at a, at a good surplus all year, um, we also have this additional 585,000 ongoing that has come. It's helping us with stirs and furs and other needs. That was the intention. Um, then you will see in here, we put a million dollar placeholder as a reduction of revenues. It is really a placeholder. I'm thinking we're going to get a lot more information as we go to the June budget adoption, some of the trailer bills that come out. Um, it is pretty conservative to put that there, but what we don't know, Prop 30, the sales tax portion, the 0.25% will go away. No one's, no one's voting to extend that in November. Um, the state is telling us we don't need to worry about that, but Leangela and I just wanted to be a little extra conservative 
and say, but will that reduce the state revenues overall and will that increase what they call a deficit? They always did. We don't get a hundred pennies on the dollar. They always give us a little less. So it's a conservative placeholder for now and you'll see that in there as well. Um, Prop 39 energy efficiency is 350,000, about 100,000 more than we usually get one time. We have student success, student equity at no, no increases. Strong funding, no increases, same one-to-one -one match, which is great. Scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment. This is actually quite a bit of money. So if you, if you add it up to 1.7 and some million, um, getting 850,000 or so for both scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment, if we go with the 50-50 split, which we usually do, would really help us along that path. And that, I, I will say that may come down. So it already came down, it may revise, and by June adoption it might come down a little bit, but it's still looking pretty good, even if, if it comes down a bit. Um, strong workforce program, CTE funding, this is all the talk and all the rage among the academic folks uh, throughout the state, just because it's a lot of money, 200 million for the state, but, it, but it's really not a new concept. The um, CTE funding and the way those programs align and work together have always been there. But this could be 1.6 million for our region. We have to collaborate and work with other workforce, labor, civic groups. Um, and then currently they are saying it could be 60% to us, the district, 40% to the region. There's still some back and forth here before the final budget for maybe a 70-30. But a 60-40 would bring in almost a million dollars um, additional to us alone, and that's ongo ongoing, that's not one time, and it would be for our um, career technical education. And if you folks have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. Um, stirs and purrs, I want you to, this is, there's a lot of nuances here, so I want you to understand what's in here. In the budget, there is not new dollars for our 16-17 obligations. Those were already put in in 1516 as a placeholder, and the amounts happen to be 416,255. But what is in this budget, as long as this will go, is a budget placeholder for the next year. You, you might catch the trend. We've done that now for two years. We've put that budget placeholder in to be sure we don't get caught somewhere without enough money to fund it the next year down. So um, next year is 620,000. It's in our 1617 budget as a placeholder for the increased cost 1718. You'll see those costs spelled out in a minute. So let's keep moving. You might know there is zero health and welfare cap increase in this budget. Reason being, we have the possibility if each unit decides to to go to CISC as a new provider, which is an 8% reduction from our current cost. Add that to our current provider, CBT, which is a 4.6% increase cost coming up on us. So that's quite a, a saving. So um, there is nothing budgeted there. Mandated cost. We had a lot of fun last year divvying up a lot of one-time dollars for mandate cost reimbursement. Apparently, there's a little more trickling in, and that's not really a little. That could be a lot. Um, 845000 was our amount at May Revise, but I have heard that the legislature's already proposed to lower that. And I don't know exactly where. I threw 600,000 in there as a ballpark. But we'll hear in June. But we will be bringing that to you as we get closer. Probably in fall, we'll start bringing some ideas for spending, bringing it through our governance process at the district. And then we'll budget it and have the board approve it when it's received. Um, Purse and stirs that we discussed. Now this doesn't show 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16 when this started, but it shows current, the, the year we're budgeting forward and forward. And just look at those dollars. Every year we're having to come up with these new amounts to fund the increased PERS and STRS costs. So you have STRS increased, PERS increased, total district from 16, 17 forward is almost three million. So that's why we're trying to be really prudent and make sure that we have those dollars budgeted in advance and we don't get um, caught without the funds necessary. Um, this is our unrestricted total budget. This is what we're presenting to you tonight. In-cut revenues, 54.3 million for unrestricted, 67.7 for our total combined restricted and unrestricted. Right there is where you see that million dollar placeholder. And then we have our certificated, classified benefits, materials and supplies, contracted capital transfers. 
and so we have our total expenditures. And this is what I'm calling our strong, healthy budget. So we have a 1.681 surplus as we enter this year. Those are ongoing dollars that we have budgeted. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, it just is our reality, especially with these person stirs, but if you look at those benefits compared to the salaries, it's just an amazing number that, that we do have to come up with to fund. Um, fund balance is always of interest. So our fund balance in the general fund, both restricted and unrestricted, primarily unrestricted, is because we always assume that restricted is going to be 100% spent. So um, our beginning fund balance is 8.8 million. That's 16.8% that's is what we're looking at starting the year with. The surplus that you just saw, not counting mandate reimbursement, could get us up to this 10.5, which actually works out close to 20%. Just know that our board policy um, mandates 6%, and then the additional fund balance gets us up above our board priority, a current of which is 15%. Our, our yes. Six, I thought we changed that. Yeah. We did. You, no, our, our board policy, in policy it still says 6, right. but our priority every year, and so we shoot for the priority as our goal, the policy is there in case I think we hit a recession again and we don't have to revise right. the board yeah. policy. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, but we increased each year in our board priority and reflect refer to our board priority for the goal we're setting that year to achieve in our reserve. No, I understand. I just yeah. got uh -huh. a normal picture problem here for a second. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go through this next part pretty fast. I'm not going to read the links, but I wanted you to at least know that we are addressing how do our resource allocations really link, how do they tie to our district goals, our district objectives. And I actually think it's kind of a beautiful thing. If you do read it, um, almost everything that we're spending money on really does tie to our district goals and our district objectives. So starting out, we have 12 new full-time faculty, five full-time counselors, they're all categorical, one full-time curriculum coordinator, some of these are replacements, um, a full-time temp, you met, our librarian, and two full-time non-tenure track CCPT faculty, um, Thad and Jennifer could tell me what CCPT is again. It's Pathways That's like College. The agreement we just approved. Cool. Pathways. Okay. Yes, they will be at the Tulare um, Joint Unified School District. Paid out uh, of this grant. Yeah. Career Pathways Trust. Grant. Yes. Yes. So you can see the goals: goal one, two, and three, and it even meets our mission. Um, this budget also includes four new point five lab assistants, um, academic lab assistants, a CTE, two science and one uh, intramural athletics for their equipment. There's the goals, um, it includes one new microcomputer specialist. It includes one new half-time copy mail staff. And you'll see a lot of these are half-time because we're still trying to be conservative. We don't, the, the microcomputer specialist is the only full-time. We have a new custodial supervisor, actually replacing a custodial lead, so not much expense there. A uh, new .5 FTE custodian, this thing doesn't go too fast. Um, above base, we usually have 100,000. We're increasing that to 50,000. And our course leaf annual contract, which will replace uh, curriculum. A lot of these things come through our what we call our base budget augmentation process. So these are our uh, resource allocations. Increasing summer school budget, that was simply the reality of our need because of our increased demand. Uh, library LRC hours, I think that's at Tulare location, but it, it extends to 6 p.m. a number of days. Um, increased funds for law school bar initiative, and there were various uh, components to that. Athletics conference, the, that was just expanded. We had to increase the travel costs. Saracoso. I, I can't even say it. Where yeah. was it? Saracoso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Human resources just was a need. They were always ending up in the hole, whether it's advertising, fingerprinting, TB testing, ergonomics. So we did increase uh, human resources, fiscal services. These are just some basic needs that we needed to meet. Um, and there was also facilities, grounds and custodial supplies, primarily for Hanford there, and increased chartered transportation budgets, 12,000. Oops. Oh, well. For all of those, those are through what we call a base budget augmentation process as well. Wow. And once again, these are all the non-faculty uh, positions that were added. Again, most of them are about a half time. 
Um, this gives you our fiscal solvency projections. This actually tells you how we calculate it. The next slide will give it to you. But if you want to know what are we projecting, we're going to look at 1718 for unrestricted and 1819. We have step and column. We're assuming zero health and welfare benefits, being safe there. PERS, I want PERS and STRS, I want you to know this is actually assuming budgeting one year in advance. And we haven't done that budget. This is just on paper. But this is what it would look like if we budgeted 1819 in 1718 and 1920 in 1819. So to me, it's kind of exciting to see that we could maybe see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel there. Okay. Uh, utilities, insurance, uh, just a small estimate for fawn, less some retirees. And then I'll talk you through the COLA and growth. So this is what it actually looks like on paper. This is our year, 1617, 1718, 1819. And it does march down. It assumes 1% um, COLA and no growth. Uh, that could flip. We could have zero COLA and we could have 1.25% growth. They're about equal. But our reality is we've been growing pretty healthy. This year we're over 5%. We may be at about 3% next year. Um, that's a lot of where our revenues are coming from right now is our growth. And so this could be better than this scenario. But this gives, this shows you at least that we're still in the red. Um, Leandro just gave me this final number this morning. I was happy to hear that. Uh, three years out. So, And then our FTES, you get to see, some year I'll take off those old years. But for now, 15, 16. No me from it's a good reminder. It is, it's great to see. But 15, 16, we raised the budget. And again, I think that was tonight as we end the year to 93, 90. Our latest count is 93.85, so we're right there close. Next year, we're budgeting at 9,400, and we could earn, if we grew that much, up to 96.80, so an extra 280 there, which is good news. Categorical restricted, I won't Christine, read all of these. Christine, Sorry, hold on. I just had a question back on one of your, you don't need to go back, okay. but uh, utilities, for instance, $50,000 uh -huh. increase. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me, uh, I'm thinking with the solar, uh, maybe we would be going the other way. We, well, we won't go the other way per se, because I think as of this 16, 17, we've now claimed all our savings in an ongoing manner. But what I do, what I do want to share, that's a 3%. 3% is a historical, it's about a 20 or 30 year average. But sometimes I just look at that as a placeholder for other things that might go up that we aren't really counting. Inflation. Um, for instance, Fuel. for instance, workers' comp, we had a placeholder for a 5% increase because that's our average for property and liability workers' comp. Workers' comp ended up going down as we adopted this budget. But other things went up, and I'm forgetting what all they are, but we sit down in our list. Actually, it's in here. So it's kind of a placeholder <coughs> is how I look at it. Um, anyway, so growth could be promising, categorical, restricted. If you want to see what's in our other programs, they amount to um, 8.9 million for last year and 9.3 for this year. So they have gone up. Um, a lot of them are similar, but some the big increases were scheduled maintenance, instructional equipment, and then you'll note student success, student equity, the same. So, um, and then I won't go great detail here, but what we've tried to do is pull ag instruction funds out of the ag farm funds. So this basically shows your agriculture instruction funds. And we're always going to spend a little bit more than, than we make here. But uh, if you add up both of these screens, you've got total expenses of 183000 total revenue of thirty one, And that's, you're familiar, our farming actually supplements that. That's where that difference comes from. Lottery has started supplementing this as well. And we have 33000 every year for that. And then when you get to the actual farm, we have alfalfa, crops, dairy, almonds, oh, all of that. And um, total expenses are fortunately a little less than total revenues. A little hard to read there, but 301000 But don't make much. And uh, this is actually unique because we're starting our almonds now. So we're going to have an almond <coughs> unit, which would be actually the trees and the cost to get those capitalized. And then we're going to have an almond operations loan since we're not gleaning our revenue from the other crops we would do there. Linda could explain that beautifully, but better than I. Okay, and then other funds, if you're interested, these are the revenues and expenses. 
I always enjoy looking at the fund balance, and those are not on here, but they are in the budget book if you care to look at that. But you can just see what's happening, RGO bonds, some of those others. Capital projects is going to have a lot of expenses because we moved money from our mandate cost one-time reimbursement in there. Now we're going to try and spend it during 16 and 17. So I think we're close to the end here. More other funds and more other funds. Actually, there was a total there, total expense, total. Nope, that's just one fund. And that's done for question and comments. All right, you've managed to uh, compress a lot of information into uh, however many slides that yeah. was. Uh, but it is good to see that uh, things are looking up. I hope I didn't go and too fast, but if you have any questions, yeah, like feel free. Yeah, I know you went too fast, fast. You okay. went too fast for me. I know that. Well, just, just as a, just as a, I said this before, but I really appreciate this multi-year thinking. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's a mistake that the college didn't always do in recent years we have. It sure makes the guy sleep better. Yeah. Well, I remember you asking those questions about five, six years ago, and we didn't have those answers. Yeah. We were probably, it's probably a good thing we didn't have them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't want to know them. Yeah. Then you wouldn't sleep at all. So this is for approval tonight. Okay, it is for approval. Are we, we're approving the tentative budget. Yes. John All right, I would entertain a motion. So moved. John moved or do you want a second, mm -hmm. right? Second. Uh, okay, we have a motion and a second for the approval of the 16-17 tentative budget as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Item 20, the inter, inter fund district loan. Okay, this should be quick. We do this annually and we ask your uh, approval of a resolution that would then allow our fiscal services department to transfer funds if we're ever in need to cover payroll. So move. Second. Second. Thank you. <laughs> second. We do have a motion a second for the adoption of resolution 2016-06. Uh, Megan, would you please poll the board? Trustee Zumwalt. Aye. Trustee Cardoza. Aye. Trustee Mann. Aye. Trustee Sherman. Aye. Trustee Nunes. Aye. All right, another resolution, education protection account requirements for 1617 fiscal year. Yeah, so this is also annual about this time. The EPA came from Prop 30 that voters approved. And we have to say, we have to have the board approve a resolution as to how we're going to spend that. And in the attachment to the resolution, similar to prior years, we are asking to, um, oops, let's get it, to spend it on instructional salaries and benefits. And our total EPA is 8.117, almost 8.118 million. So we're seeking approval of that resolution. Any questions on that? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second for the adoption of resolution 2016-07. Uh, Would you please pull the board, Megan? Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Mann? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Jumwalt? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. All right, another resolution, 2016-10, uh, so bank signatures. Yeah, this should be simple, but this is um, requiring your approval as of the resolution to remove Joe Rope from our food services bank account and to add Zachary Patterson as so our moved. new food services manager. Second. We have a motion and a second for resolution 2016-10. Megan, would you please once again pull the board? Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Mann? Aye. Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Zumwalt? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. Motion unanimously adopted. Looks like uh, Mr. Woods is next with the uh, construction plan. Yes. Before you, you have the 2018-2022 five-year construction yeah. plan. And this is submitted to the Chancellor's Office every June. The plan provides the Chancellor's Office with a detailed summary of current and proposed capital outlay projects. So just a reminder, the, in regards to the term 2018 through 2022, 20 the Chancellor's Office plans all projects two years in advance. So that's the reason for the dates there. Um, so due to the fact that the state did not fund capital outlay projects in the recent fiscal year, as we touched on a little earlier, the district intends to resubmit all projects on the attached list. So I'll give you a quick update on those projects. You can refer to the attached sheet there. Uh, project number one. This is still in the Cuban fusion. Um, this is the 
first phase of Tulare. There's a lot of paperwork that needs to be closed out, so we'll get that closed out before the end of the month here. Project number two, now this is the big one we were talking about a few moments ago. The Basic Skills Center, now it replaces the existing Buckeye and General Grant buildings with a new Basic Skills Center, approximately 15,000 square feet, assignable square feet. It is currently FPP approved um, and it scores practically perfectly at the state level and has been locked in for state funding. So regarding that bond we were talking about, for the first time since 2006, there will be a public education facilities bond initiative on the November 8th ballot this year. So a yes vote would approve, for those of you who don't know the details, a yes vote would approve $9 billion in bonds to fund improvement and construction of, sco of school facilities for K through 12 and community colleges. Of that $9 billion, $2 billion is exclusively for community colleges. So the Chancellor's Office has published their list of pre-approved locked-in projects, and the Basic Skills Center project is on that list. Uh, so to reiterate the two-year planning term, almost all the projects on this pre-approved list were submitted as an FPP in June 2014 for funding in the upcoming fiscal year, this next fiscal year. Now the term FPP, IPP, you'll see that on all these different projects. IPP is an initial project proposal. It's the, it's the first step in the cap, capital outlay planning, uh, project planning. It consists of a simple three-page narrative from the district that outlines the intent of the project with generalized square footages, estimated project costs. And then uh, after it's been submitted and approved as an IPP, you can submit it normally a year later as a final project proposal. And that's typically a 50, 50 page document or so, much more detailed version of an IPP. Um, and then once that FPP is approved, the project can be locked in for consideration of funding at the state level. So back to this project number two, you'll see the status FPP approved. Uh, it's locked in for uh, approval of the state bond in November with the occupancy date of 2020-2021. Got the cost right there in front of you. Um, jumping into number three, now this one, this project has been reclassified as an IPP approved by the Chancellor's Office due to the low scoring that we were talking about. Um, your scoring is, is um, made up of a number of factors. Most importantly for Tulare, it's growth, it's enrollment, or the lack of enrollment out there. And Christine touched on the fact that we just recently over the last year shifted a majority of the WISH or FTES from, well, Hanford's FTES and WISH was carried by Tulare up until last year. So we finally split it, that caused the score of the project to go down immensely. Um, so simply put, Tulare campus is still new, it's young, um, and it must experience more enrollment growth to compete for, state, for funding at the state level. And I'm hopeful that we can actually get this to an FPP status next June. Uh, it's going to take a lot of creativity on my end to make that happen, so I'll do my best. Um, and then number four and five, they're similar. Uh, they are also IPP approved, and depending on the project scores and acceptance by the Chancellor's Office, we'll try to resubmit these as FPPs next June as well. So the current building modernization that's here on the Visalia campus, that would, be pra that would be include practically gutting the building, taking it down to the structure itself, and then uh, putting together a new layout. I think it consists of a combination of classroom, a little bit of lab space, mainly the same functions that are in there now, just rehabbing the building. And then number five on the list, <coughs> maintenance and operations renovation. Uh, that would be retrofitting the Cedar building, which is currently the auto shop and wood shop building. So with that said, uh, let's see, we've got this, let's see, I'd like to re recommend that the board authorize the 2016 submittal of the 2018-2022 five-year construction plan. Anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, just make, uh, uh, in a prior meeting we talked about the, the quad thing at, at Hanford. Yes. That's not on here because it's funded from different money. It's funded right. locally. We can include it on there. It doesn't really help you. It doesn't hurt you. I just, um, I, I just want to understand. That yes, though. it is on the agenda. Yeah. Right. Actually, that's, that's slated for construction next spring. Okay. Right. And that funding is separate, John, so that's uh, we're, we're full steam ahead on that. Yeah. Well, I thought it was one of the mature. Um, I know you can't undo projects, and that, this is probably a silly question, but <clears throat> in terms of Tulare um, regarding um, the, new, the new construction there, um, in any way does the state allow you to rethink or re 
group and maybe you don't if the college isn't growing as quickly but to get something I mean is, is that worth thought or definitely. are we considering that mm -hmm. yeah we definitely can in fact any of the projects we have the opportunity to resubmit a project every every June okay. whether or not it's an IPP or an FPP um, if it's an FPP approved that we're submitting right now like the basic skills center if we want to make any changes they would ask us to go take a step back. Yeah, you don't want to do that. as an IPP, yeah. you're losing out on your opportunity. But like so, in Tulare, you could rethink that one. I, think I, I don't know. You could, if, okay. if we looked that. at projected enrollment and what the long-term plan was. Turning that into another phase. I mean, maybe you get something for now right. that'll, I guess instead of leasing a building in Tulare for 10 years, I would right. hope we would get what we needed right. and this then project, plan another phase. This project includes, I believe, two lab buildings. Okay. So maybe right now we only look at one. Yep, okay, good, Right. So, perfect. Right. Okay, yeah. just wanted to put that out there. So I approve. Are we okay? Good. Yes, for the motion. I second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the five-year construction plan for submittal. Uh, any additional discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, you're good to go. Uh, board policies. Okay, we have two items. The first one uh, will be quick. These board policies under item number 24 are back for a second and possible final reading. Um, you've seen these once now for information. Um, BP 5500, which is standards of conduct. BP 5510, which is student use of electronic devices. And board policy 5515, which based on um, your input and recommendation last time, is being recommended for deletion. That was the off-campus student organization. Mm -hmm. So with your approval tonight, these would clear their second reading. I move we approve the second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval for the second read of board policies 5500, 5510, and 5515. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, <coughs> last but not least, uh, uh, board policies first read. We don't okay. have our student rep here, unfortunately, darn it. I know. I know. When we do pass the student once, he's not here. <laughs> I know. He was here when these were going but they, through but Academic Senate, yeah, Perfect. and they've given us great input on these. Okay. These are non-10 plus ones. The first is 5410, which deals with associated student elections. We went through, mostly this was updating terminology to move away from associated student body and align them with the new terminology, which is a college student senate. The other thing it does is um, it sets up the timing for um, spring elections or for the student senate general election when it's held, um, kind of their timelines for doing that and bringing that up to date. That's in board policy 5410, so that's a first reading for your information tonight. The next one, uh, board policy, again, a non-10 plus one, 5420 is um, relative to student financing and again uh, this was specific to updating the terminology to student senate making sure that we reference the appropriate administrative procedure and then in the bullets uh, denoting the um, students student senators participation in signing and authorizing expenditures and checks and the last one is 55 7 and this is student credit card um, solicitation and it's just a requirement that uh, if we had uh, the um, service provided for students on campus that uh, we have the uh, procedures established by the president's office for solicitation of student credit cards on campus okay thank so you very much to approve on the second read second. we have a motion and a second to approve and move to second reading of uh, uh, board policies uh, 5410, 5420, and 5570. Further discussion? Not. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Well, there we go. Last item on the agenda. Thank you all of those for uh, uh, <laughs> sticking with us. I think we have maybe a couple of more uh, just, comments here. Just an yeah. announcement. Uh, uh, next month I'll not be here. It'll be the second meeting I've missed in over in 20-some years, but anyway, I'll be out of state in July, and I'm sure
sure you'll do just fine without me. <laughs> <laughs> and I also will be out of country, so I will, we, both of us will be gone. So let's hope that Greg and Earl and Ken are here. Oh, wow. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a quorum for our July meeting. Yeah, I so, know. Uh, so, uh, no, don't get sick. Uh, Stan, if there's anything you want to get through the agenda, that'll be the month. This is the time, Stan. <laughs> All right. Uh, Christine, or solar. solar, it seemed to me like looking at the bills that the payment to Edison was down considerably. It really is. Yeah. yeah. It looked like in the thirty to 40000 category. Exactly. All the money's going to the yep. solar company. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For a few years. Yeah. Byron reminded me we have a loan payment, but we're just yes. thankful. It's all part of the calculation. All right, well, listen, uh, thank you all once again, and uh, uh, have a good evening, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bang. Thank you, whoever's responsible. Thank you, Earl. Everybody worked yeah, on it. Work thank you. Perfect. <laughs> a lot better? Yeah. It worked. All right. Take care. I could even hear you, John. <laughs> No, I don't want to Signatures. Sign. Do I have to sign anything? You do need to sign this one, the appointment. Good job. Thanks for your patience in closed session. I think that's going to help us break the logjam tomorrow. Oh, one more for you. Wow. The negotiations. Board elections.